So we've spent some videos looking at the exterior derivative that takes differential m forms and turns them into differential m plus one forms. And today what we wanna do is look at a very special property of this derivative, work out some examples that highlight that property, and then give some context to what's happening maybe in a multivariable calculus type setting. So let's just recall that omega is a differential m form on Rn, means that it can be written as the sum over multi-indices i of f sub i dx sub i, where again, that i is a multi-index, and it is made up of these uh, numbers i1 through im that are strictly increasing, and they're between one and n. And this dxi is given to be dxi1 wedge dx i2 all the way up to dx i m and that's known as an elementary m form on r n and in some previous videos we highlighted the action of that on a vector in the tangent space at a certain point and then earlier we came up with this notion of the exterior derivative and we saw that a nice definition for it was the following so we've got d omega is again, it's the sum over this multi-index, but then inside of that sum over the multi-index, we have the sum from j equals one to n of the partial of fi with respect to xj. And then we're taking this new one form, dxj, and wedging it into our dxi, which is our multi-index. And so notice this guy, right here is an elementary m plus one form because it's the wedge product of an elementary one form and an elementary m form. Okay, great. Oh, and I should say here that these fi's are smooth functions. So in other words, they're infinitely differentiable on a certain open set in Rn, obviously. Okay, so the proposition that we wanna look at today is the following. So let's suppose that omega is a differential m form on Rn, then we have the following, d squared applied to omega, in other words, d applied to d omega is equal to zero. So if you take two exterior derivatives of a differential m form, you'll get zero. Okay, so first I wanna look at some examples, and I wanna look at maybe a zero form on R4, a one form on R4 and a two form on R4. And I wanna do R4 so that we can work up to doing a second derivative of a two form, which notice that's gonna take us into a two plus two, in other words, a four form. So we need to work over R4 for there to even be a notion of a four form. Okay, so like I said, we're first going to start with a zero form on R4. And so notice that's just a function. So a zero form is another name for a function. Great. So that means we have F, so we're going to apply our exterior derivative, and that's gonna give us DF, which is equal to the partial of F with respect to X, DX, the partial of F with respect to Y, DY, the partial of f with respect to z, dz, and then finally the partial of f with respect to w, dw. And here we're using, like as our coordinates here, uh, dx, dy, dz, and dw. Great, so this would be the, the derivative of the zero form, notice we get a one form. Okay, so now we're gonna need to apply this formula in order to find the exterior derivative of the derivative of f, so let's see that. So here I'm going to apply our D operator one more time. That's gonna give us D squared F. And that means I need to run through each sum and from this right hand side. I need to run through the partial with respect to X, Y, Z, and W, and then wedge these elementary one forms with DX, DY, DZ, and DW. So notice here, I've already got a partial derivative. So if I take the partial derivative with respect to X, I'll get the second partial derivative with respect to X. If I take the partial with respect to Y, I'll get some mixed partial and so on and so forth. So let's see what we get. So for this first term, we'll have the partial of F with respect to X and that's the second partial. And then we'll have DX wedge DX. And then next, 
we'll have the second partial with respect to um, y and x, and this will be dy wedge dx. And then the second partial, this is a mixed partial also with respect to z and x, this will be dz wedge dx. And then finally, the second partial with respect to w and x, and this will be dw wedge dx. Okay, so that's what I get for this first term. Okay, so now let's write down what we get for all of the other terms. Maybe we'll kind of skip to it, have it having it written down. Okay, so now we've got all of these worked out. So notice we have 16 terms because each of these four terms spread out into four more terms. So let's just like look at what can cancel. So notice dx wedge dx is zero, so we know that this becomes zero. dy wedge dy is also zero, so we know that becomes zero. dz wedge dz is zero, so that becomes zero. And then dw wedge dw is zero, so we know that becomes zero. Next, we know that dy wedge dx is negative dx wedge dy. And furthermore, by Clairaut's theorem, we know these mixed partials are equal. So that makes this guy cancel with that guy. Furthermore, dz wedge dx is negative dx wedge dz. And then again, those mixed partials are the same. So this one cancels with this one. And then the same thing for dw wedge dx. So this one is going to cancel with this one. Great. And then next, dz wedge dy is negative dy wedge dz. And then we have those mixed partials, which are the same. Um, dy wedge dw is the same thing as dw wedge dy with a minus sign. And the mixed partials are the same. And then finally, dw wedge dz and dz wedge dw have opposite signs. So those cancel as well, again, because those mixed partials are the same. So notice everything cancels off and we're left with this whole thing equals zero. Okay, so maybe we're gonna skip the example of a one form on R4, but we'll jump to an example of a two form on R4 to work that out as well. So we just did an example where when we apply the exterior derivative operator twice to a zero form on R4, that turns it into a two form on R4, but that two form is identically zero. Now we wanna check the same kind of thing works for a two form on R4. And so since we have a linear operator here, in other words, this derivative is a linear operator, we only need to look at one term from the sum that kind of builds up this guy and all of them are kind of the same. So we'll take our two form to be omega, which is f dx wedge dy. Good. And the kind of action we see here will follow similarly on like the dy wedge dz component and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's first calculate d omega. And so again, we'll use this definition down here. So we need to work through the partial with respect to x, y, z, and w. But in this case, we're going to save some time. And notice that we don't need to worry about the partial with respect to x or the partial with respect to y, because that will introduce a dx wedge dx and then a dy wedge dy, and those will cancel out. So all we need to worry about is the partial with respect to z and w. So let's see that. We'll have the partial of f with respect to z, and then we'll have dz wedge dx wedge dy. Great. And then next we'll have the partial of f with respect to w, and then dw wedge dx wedge dy. Good. Now, we want to take the derivative of this. In other words, we want to find d squared omega. <clears throat> so let's see what we need to do. We need to work through the partial with respect to x, y, z, and w of this thing, and the partial of x, y, z, and w of this thing, and then include a dx wedge the rest of this, a dy wedge the rest of this, and so on and so forth, and the same thing over here. But again, we can save some time and notice from this term, we don't need to worry about anything except the partial with respect to W. And that's because a partial with respect to Z would add a DZ wedge DZ, which is zero. Same thing for DX and same thing for DY. So that allows us to do this pretty quickly. So this is gonna be the partial of F with respect to W and Z. So we've got this mixed partial, and then we'll have DW wedge DZ wedge DX wedge DY. 
good. And then over here, we'll have the partial of F with respect to Z and W. And again, that's a second mixed partial. And now we'll have a DZ wedge, DW wedge, DX wedge, DY. Good. Now, the next thing that we can do is use the fact that DZ wedge DW is the same thing as minus DW wedge DZ. And furthermore, by Clairaut's theorem, because we're assuming that this original function is smooth, in other words, infinitely differentiable, we know that these two guys are equal. So we've got something that has equal and opposite. So in other words, this cancels to zero. So we did our example a zero form on R4. We skipped our example a one form on R4. I would uh, urge you guys to work out the details for that. Then we looked at our example of a two form on R4. Now we're gonna do our general proof of our proposition. So we just looked at some motivating examples. Now we wanna consider this in general. In other words, if we've got omega, which is a differential M form on Rn, if we apply this exterior derivative operator to it twice, we will necessarily get zero. So since the exterior derivative operator is a linear operator, all we need to do is consider its action on one of these components. If we can show that its action on one of these components will be to change it into zero, then obviously its action on the whole thing will be the same thing because we'll just have a sum of a bunch of zeros. So in other words, what we'll do is just set omega equal to f dxi. Great, where again, f is a function of n variables. And then this is uh, our dxi1 wedge all the way up to dxim. Great. So now we can immediately apply this exterior derivative operator d omega. And that's going to give us, by this definition over here, the sum as j goes from 1 to n of the partial of f with respect to xj. And then we have dxj wedged into dxi. So we've got our new elementary one form, dxj, that's wedged into our old elementary m form making this entire thing a differential m plus one form, which is what we want it to be because this derivative operator should take a differential m form and turn it into a differential m plus one form. Good, now let's go ahead and take the derivative again. So that's gonna give us d squared omega. Now we'll have a double sum. So this is the sum as k goes from one to n, and then the sum as j goes from one to n, and now we have the second partial of f with respect to xk and xj. And now we have dxk wedged into dxj wedged into dxi. Great. Now the next thing that I want to notice is I don't need to consider the case when j and k are the same. Because in that case, I'll have something like dxk wedge dxk, but we know that's zero by the anti-commutativity of the wedge product. So that means here I can just point out that j is not equal to k. Now the next thing that I wanna do is split this inner sum into two pieces. One, j going from one to k minus one, and the other from k plus one to n. So let's go ahead and do that. So that's gonna give us this sum on the outside, k equals one to n. Now we're splitting this one up into the sum as j goes from one to k minus one of this second partial of f with respect to x, k, and x, j. And now we have dx, k, wedge, dx, j, wedge, dx, i. So that's the first bit of the sum. And now the next bit of the sum will be this sum as j goes from k plus one up to n. And now the same kind of thing in here. So that second partial of f with respect to xk and xj. And then we have a dxk wedge dxj wedge dxi. Great. Now the next thing that I want to do is Notice that this second sum, which is in fact a double sum, I'll go ahead and bring this sum over here just as a reminder. So outside of this, we have the sum k equals one to n. So notice what our indexes are doing. So we have uh, k is bigger than or equal to one, but then it's strictly less than j, but then that is less than or equal to n. 
good. So we can use that to change the order of summation as follows. Now, instead of having the sum k equal one to n on the outside and j equals k plus one to n on the inside, we can change this to the sum as j goes from one to n on the outside and then k goes from one to j minus one on the inside because notice we have the strict inequality here so we end up right at uh, j minus one is the upper limit for k. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll write this on the next board at the top where we have changed this sum order. So on the last board, we applied our exterior derivative operator two times to our differential m form, and then we split that up into two double sums, re-indexing the second double sum. But now these guys look almost exactly the same, just with the indices switched. And so we can just perform an index change here. Like in other words, I'm going to rename j k, and I'll rename k j. So I can make this go from k equals one to n, and then this thing from j equals one to k minus one. Like I said, I just renamed my indices, but I don't need to do anything to this derivative because it's exactly the same given Clairaut's theorem. We know that those second partials are the same since we've got a smooth function. But now here we're replacing dxk and dxj in this wedge product. But again, we don't need to erase anything there because we know by the anti-commutativity of the wedge product, we can just put a minus sign right there. But after all of that, we see that this first sum and this second sum are exactly the same, which means they cancel, which tells us we get zero. Good. And then finally, if we had a more general differential M form like this, we took the derivative of that twice. Well, the derivative would just pass inside the sum twice, and that would just cancel everything out just as needed. So in other words, we have an explanation of this proposition. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and clean up the board and we'll look at how this is related to something you've seen in a multivariable calculus. So now that we've seen this proposition in general, I wanna point it back towards something that you've probably seen in multivariable calculus class. And that is this kind of sequence of types of derivatives. So we started with functions on R3. You could take the gradient of a function on R3 and that gives you a vector field on R3. You could take the curl of a vector field on R3 and that would give you another vector field on R3. And then finally, you could take the divergence of a vector field on R3 and that would bring you back to a function of R3. Now, how you wanna think about this is this is like a zero form on R3, one form, two form, three form on R3. And if you recall, kind of a classic example or exercise in multivariable calculus is that if you take f to be any function and then you apply the gradient to f and then you apply the curl to that, you get zero. And then another really popular example or exercise in multivariable calculus is if you take a vector field on R3 and you apply the curl to that vector field, and then you apply the divergence to that curl, you'll get zero. Great. But now, if we were to twist our minds, and instead of thinking about this gradient, curl, and divergence as all different things, and looking at them as all versions of the same thing, d, 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 where just depending on the setting, D has a slightly different action, then notice that this equation right here becomes D squared F equals zero. And this equation right here becomes D squared F equals zero as well. And so that's in fact what we're uncovering here is some sort of generalization of the notion of gradient curl and divergence away from just R3 and away from just the notion of a vector field into these M forms on Rn. Okay, that's a good place to stop.